This week we are studying the book of Romans, chapter 13. Such a short little chapter that it's easy to read, and I would encourage you to read it over this afternoon again if you've been reading it all week. Read it once again, and then come and join with us tonight as we study the 13th chapter of the book of Romans. This morning we'd like to draw your attention uh, to verses 11 through 14, where Paul is declaring, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Paul said, knowing the time. I'm firmly convinced that the Lord wants us to know the times in which we are living. In order that we might know when the Lord is coming. I believe that that is one of the chief purposes of prophecy. That we might be alerted to those times that are prophesied that will precede the coming of our Lord. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees in Matthew 16, 2 uh, for the fact that they weren't aware of the time. He said, when it is evening and the sky is red, you say, oh, we're going to have a fair day tomorrow. But if in the morning, if the sky is red and overcast, you say, oh, going to be bad weather today. He said, you know how to discern the skies as far as telling the weather, but you do not discern the time of my coming. And so it was a rebuke. In other words, they should have known that they should be looking for the Messiah. The angel had told Daniel that there were 483 years that would, trans that would transpire between the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. In other words, the Lord gave them the year in which the Messiah would come. 483 years after the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. They all knew that the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem had gone forth from Artaxerxes. They knew that it was about 483 years since that commandment had gone forth. And so they should have been looking for the Messiah. Had they read and discerned the word of God, they would have known that the Messiah was coming this very year. And so the Lord is rebuking them uh, for not knowing, for not being aware, uh, for you might say sleeping when the Messiah came. What time is it? From the prophecies of the scriptures, we must deduce that these are what the scriptures call the last days. We're very close to the time of the coming of our Lord. And the Lord gave us a lot of signs to look for that we might be alert, that we might be aware that the time of the Lord's coming is very, very close. Paul wrote to Timothy, in his second letter, know this, that in the last days, perilous times would come. 
because men would love themselves and uh, they would be proud, boastful, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. They would be without natural affections. And let me say natural affections is for a man to love a woman and a woman to love a man. That's natural. And anything else is unnatural. But they will not have natural affections. They will not keep their word. They will be slanderers and without self-control. They will be brutal and despise those that are good. They will be treacherous, rash, and conceited. And their love for pleasure will exceed their love for God. These are the indications, Paul said, that we will know and be assigned to us that we are in the last days. Peter talks about the last days. And in 2 Peter 3.3, 3, he said, Know this, that there shall come in the last days scoffers who are walking in their own lust, and they say, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. This is known as uniformitarianism, and it is the basis for the evolutionary theory, that all things continue as they were from the beginning, that God may have created the earth. We know that the earth began somehow, somewhere, uh, but uh, he then just sort of let it evolve on its own. And... Um, I have, I must confess, difficulty. Uh, I really don't have enough faith to believe what they say is science. For they say that this whole vast universe, all of the galaxies, all of the stars within the galaxies and the planets and the moons and so forth, all of them were at one time compressed in a small little particle of, of dust about the size of a dried pea. That just challenges my imagination. <laughs> I cannot accept that. Maybe I don't know physics well enough or maybe I'm just smart enough uh, to realize that that's stupid. It doesn't make <laughs> sense. I can't even imagine myself reduced to the size of a dried bee, <laughs> much less this whole vast universe. But that dried pea exploded in a great bang. And all of these galaxies and stars and so forth were thrust out. And, and that the sun, this ball of gas out here as it was spinning, uh, the, the planets were tossed out little balls of gases that were spinning and that as they uh, cooled off and so forth, they developed the crust and thus we have our planetary system. Um, interesting, the sun, a ball of gas spinning in a uh, clockwise direction. How is it that uh, the planets are moving in a counter clockwise direction. Wouldn't you think if we were thrown off from the sun, spinning in a clockwise, that we would be spinning clockwise around the sun instead of counterclockwise? How in the world did that happen? <laughs> well, I don't know, and neither do they. <laughs> a lot of anomalies that we just can't understand or explain. And... Uh, as Peter went on to say, that people are ignorant of the fact that God exists outside of our time continuum and that with the Lord a thousand years are as but one day and one day as a thousand years. And then he assures us that God is not slack concerning his promises. That is the promises that Jesus would come again uh, 
but he is long-suffering to us because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so he says that uh, one day the Lord will come as a thief in the night and the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Now that's a big bang and this one I do believe in. Uh, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat and the earth and all of the works that are in it will be burned up. And since all of these things are going to be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be? in all holy living and godliness as we look for the coming of the day of God wherein the heavens being on fire will be dissolved, the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, seeing that we look for such things, let us be diligent that we might be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. An account that the long-suffering of our God is to give people more time to be saved. The prophet Ezekiel testified of things that would be happening that would awaken us to the fact that we're getting close to the end. And he talks about, in chapter 36, of the redevelopment of the agricultural potential of the land of Israel. Back in 1897, the Jews uh, got the idea to go back to Israel and to begin to develop the agricultural potentials that are there. They came to the valley of Sharon, uh, which is and was at that time a boggy swamp filled with malaria. Through the years, the silt dams had developed at the Mediterranean and all of the rivers within the Sharon Valley were dammed by the silt and thus it formed just this huge swampy area. Just totally uninhabitable. But the Jews came in and began to buy up that property. And those who were selling it laughed all of the way to the bank at how foolish and stupid the Jews were for buying that worthless acreage. But when they purchased it, then they opened up the rivers. They removed the silt dams, allowing the rivers to again flow into the Mediterranean. They began to plant groves of eucalyptus trees that drink up a lot of water, and then they began to plant the citrus, and it became really a very productive area for citrus trees, and they began to sell the Jaffa oranges around the world. The same is true of the Valley of Megiddo. The Jarbok or, uh, River was dammed up with silt and it was a malaria-filled swamp. They drained that and they began to plant their very fertile soil and of course uh, it is today grows three crops a year uh, in that valley. And they developed that agricultural uh, potential just like Ezekiel prophesied they would in Ezekiel chapter 36. In fact, Ezekiel said, the desolate land will be tilled and they shall say this land that was desolate has become like the garden of Eden and the waste and the desolate and the ruined cities have become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you will know that I am the Lord that builds the ruined places, and I plant that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. I like it when God brags. Uh, you know, I said it, I'll do it. And what can you say? He's done it. 
chapter 36 of Ezekiel has been fulfilled in the last century. In Ezekiel chapter 37, the Lord said that he's going to gather then the Jews back into the land. Though they have been scattered all over the world, he's going to bring them back and plant them there in the land and they would become a nation once again. In May of 1948, they announced on the 14th that Israel was once again a nation among the nations of the world. The prophecy of Ezekiel, their becoming a nation, was fulfilled. Ezekiel went on to say that they would no longer be two nations, but they would be one nation. When Israel went into captivity, we know that at the death of Solomon, uh, the nation of Israel was divided into the northern and southern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. And uh, Israel went first captive by the Assyrians, and then about 100 years later, the southern kingdom of Judah uh, was destroyed by Babylon. But the Lord said when they come back, they'll be one nation, no longer divided, which of course, has been the case. Now, in chapter 38, the Lord said when he has gathered them again into the land and they are dwelling there, uh, that he's going to put an evil thought into the minds of, of uh, the leaders of Russia and they will mobilize the uh, Muslim nations beginning with Iran and they will attempt to annihilate uh, Israel as a nation. It's interesting, Israel has had problems from its birth. Uh, the moment that uh, Ben-Gurion announced that Israel was a nation, Syria attacked from the north and took the Golan Heights. Uh, Egypt attacked from the south and took the Sinai Peninsula, and Jordan attacked from the east and took the West Bank, uh, so that uh, Israel was left with just a small little portion of land, which they fought bravely for and were able to maintain as Israel. But then in 19... 67. Jordan, Egypt, and Syria decided that they were going to eliminate this new little nation of Israel. Uh, Nassar ordered the UN troops out of the Sinai in order to make it easy for the Egyptian troops to come marching against the little territory that was held by the Jews. But they went out and as David against Goliath, uh, the Israelis in that six day war took the Golan Heights back from Syria. They took the West Bank back from Jordan and they took the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt. So they vastly expanded their territory in 1967 in that six-day war. In 1973, again, Egypt and Syria decided that the time had come to destroy the nation of Israel. And on Yom Kippur, uh, the highest holy day for the Jews, uh, when there are no cars being driven on the streets by Jews, uh, when there are no radio or TV broadcasts, but all of the Jews are gathered in their own homes to worship the Lord. Uh, on that day, they decided was the day for their surprise attack, uh, which they called the War of Annihilation. And they were planning in that war to annihilate 
the nation of Israel. We happened to be in Israel at that very time. And uh, we were staying in uh, the Intercontinental Hotel there in the Mount of Olives. And because there were no Jewish buses running or uh, the, the streets were pretty desolate and empty, uh, the Arabs, they were up and about. And so I decided to take a group of kids uh, down to the old city and go through the old city with them uh, so that they could, uh, you know, see uh, the, the shuk there. And uh, it was just a, a time. I had about 20 kids with me. And uh, so we walked down from the Mount of Olives through the Kidron Valley up on into Jerusalem, uh, the, the old city of Jerusalem. And as we were coming into the shuk area, uh, we heard the sirens going off and uh, we saw these guys closing down uh, all of the uh, shops. And we said, hey, we're here to buy stuff. You know, why are you closing down? And, and they just uh, ignored us and closed up the old city. And so we headed back to the hotel. And when we got there, we found out of the attack against Israel. And uh, we were transferred then over to Bat Yam. And... Um, had a very interesting experience being there in that particular time. But things were not going well for Israel in 1973. The Egyptians had crossed over the Suez. They had taken uh, the Bar Lev line uh, that had been set up by Israel. Uh, they had overrun it. They were moving up through the Sinai. Uh, the Syrians had come down from uh, the Golan, they had taken the Golan Heights. They had come all the way uh, to the hills above uh, Tiberias. And uh, for some strange reason, uh, they, they stopped their advance. Uh, and uh, the Jews <laughs> laugh. They say, well, they got a good view of the, of the Sea of Galilee, so they just decided to enjoy the view. Uh, but why they stopped, nobody really knows. Uh, what they evidently didn't know, that there were fewer than 90 tanks uh, that were uh, able to stand against them from moving all the way to Haifa. Uh, but uh, the Jewish troops, uh, of course, or the Jewish people who were celebrating Yom Kippur in their homes with their families, uh, when the sirens went off, they turned on their radios and the men were being called uh, to the various places and Israel began to uh, sort of regroup and get their troops together, and they began to move the tanks up to the uh, area of the Galilee, and they began to move tanks down into the area of uh, the Sinai, and we watched this movement of tanks uh, as we were standing there in the uh, uh, Kidron Valley. But soon the tide of battle began to turn, Eric Sharon, with his armored division, uh, began to move down into the Sinai. And uh, he, he's, he was a gutsy guy. Um, they began to tell him to cease his advance. But he realized that he had the Egyptians on the run. And so he said, what was that? My radio is breaking up. I can't hear you. And uh, he continued. And uh, finally, he just disconnected the radio, and he trapped the whole third Egyptian army. And uh, he was ready to move against Cairo. And, uh, of course, up on the Golan Heights, they began to drive uh, the uh, Syrians back. Uh, they had destroyed the Syrian Air Force in, in the first couple of days. And they began to drive the Syrians back. And so Syria and Egypt began to pressure for a ceasefire. And that's when Kissinger went over and they had that Kissinger uh, shuttle diplomacy, they called it, as he was going from one capital to another trying to develop. And they did set a time for a ceasefire. And at this particular time, on this day, there it will be a ceasefire and you'll, be in the, you'll have the positions that you are holding at that time. 
Well, the Syrians, in their endeavor uh, to pressure this ceasefire, uh, to pressure the world, to pressure Israel uh, to stop, because Israel had come within 19 miles of Damascus, uh, but the Syrians began to announce on Radio Damascus, on their news, that the Israelis were at the outskirts of town and beginning to bombard Damascus. Out on the Golan Heights, the fellows who were in charge of the tanks were listening to Radio Damascus. And they heard that the Israelis had come all the way to Damascus, and they thought, whoa, we've been outflanked, we've had it. And they began to turn towards Jordan as fast as they could, driving their tanks and all of their armored equipment down towards Jordan to escape uh, the Israelis because surely Radio Damascus wouldn't be broadcasting lies. And uh, so uh, they ex actually evacuated that large portion of the Golan Heights. And what Israel did uh, was send the paratroopers in and they landed way on back uh, further than uh, Israel had ever actually occupied before, so that by the time the ceasefire came, the whole Sinai Peninsula was again in the uh, hands of the Jews, and uh, the Golan Heights again was in the hands of the Jews, and uh, they survived that war of annihilation. But they themselves admit that God was there helping them. I met Heim Herzog, the uh, president of Israel. He wrote a book called The War of Atonement, and uh, he talks about the miracles of the War of Atonement, how that God preserved them and helped them from being annihilated in that war. But in chapter 38 of Ezekiel, it tells us that there's going to be another war. This one will be Iran backed by Russia, and again will be an attempt to annihilate Israel as uh, the leader of uh, Iran is constantly telling us that uh, Israel is going to be wiped off of the face of the map, that Israel will be annihilated, uh, that it won't exist, and he is given a timing of about two years. Within two years, he declares that Israel will no longer be. Are we and can we indeed be that close? You know, it's interesting. Uh, we sort of just slumber and sleep. I, I read of a, a fellow who, uh, when they used to have those covered bridges, uh, toll bridges, uh, that uh, there was uh, this fellow and it was a heavy, heavy rainstorm and uh, he came to one of these toll bridges and he went and he knocked on the door of uh, the fellow who took the tolls and he heard a voice from inside say, coming! And so he waited there getting soaked in the rain and no one came so he knocked on the door again and he heard the voice say, coming! And so he waited and again continued to rain and get soaked. No one came and so he really began to bang on the door. And this fellow came rather sheepishly and very sleepily, and he said, uh, I'm sorry, he said, I've been on the job so long, when people knock, I just don't even wake up. I just call coming. And he, he apologized for his not being there to open the, the bridge for this fellow who wanted to cross. And I'm afraid that much of the church is like that. Jesus is sort of knocking at the door, and we say, coming, but we sleep on. And, and now we are getting so close. And, and so the warnings of the scripture are to wake up. Uh, this is what Paul is telling us here in Romans chapter 11, knowing the time, it's high time to wake up out of our sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than it was at the beginning. Jesus said to his disciples, watch therefore, for you do not know the 
when the master of the house is coming. It may be in the evening, maybe at midnight, maybe when the rooster is crowing in the morning, but you don't want him to catch you sleeping when he comes. So I say unto you, wake up. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, and he said, for you know perfectly well that the day of the Lord is coming as a thief in the night. For when they are saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them and they shall not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Therefore, stay awake, be alert, be sober. Peter warned, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be sober, watch and pray. Jesus said to the church of Sardis, remember how you have received and hurt and hold tight. If you do not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you do not know what hour I will come upon you. As Paul said, now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Every day brings us one day closer to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we do not want to be as those wicked servants that Jesus spoke of who began to say, well, the Lord delays his coming. And, and they began to live after the flesh. And Jesus said, the Lord will come at a time in which they are not prepared. And he will cut them in sunder and give their portion, give them their portion with the unbelievers. Jesus warned his disciples, take heed, lest at any time your lives become so involved in eating and drinking and the cares of this world that that day catches you sleeping. As Paul said, the night is far spent. The world has gone through a long night of darkness and it is getting darker. But thank God, we can see the dawning of a new day. And so Paul says, let's put off the works of darkness. And he describes these works as riotous living, drunkenness, sexual immorality, debauchery, dissension, and jealousy. He said, let's put on the armor of light. And he describes that as putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and making no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Do not let your carnal desires control your life. You know that one of my greatest concerns as the pastor of this church is that there are many people who listen to me Sunday after Sunday who are sleeping. And when our Lord comes, they will be like the five foolish virgins, not ready. As Jesus gave that parable of his coming, he said, they that were ready went in. And I am fearful that there are many who will not be awake. They won't be ready. And when the Lord comes, they will be left here because they haven't taken heed to the word of the Lord. It doesn't mean that they're going to be lost, but it means that to be saved is going to be difficult. It will be through martyrdom. It will be through their refusal to take that mark that everyone will be required to take if they're going to buy or sell. That mark that will be forced, and if a person refuses, they'll be put to death. But that's a hard way to go. And, and I'm fearful that there are many that are going to be in that number that are not really ready, alert, waiting, and looking for the Lord to return. But are like the foolish servant that said, my Lord delays his coming. And, and they live as though there was not going to be any radical change very soon. But I'm convinced that we are on the border 
of the return of the Lord. You say, oh, Chuck, you said that back in 1970. Yep. <laughs> and we are now 37 years closer. But we're getting very, very close. So, as Paul said, knowing the time, high time to wake up out of our sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The day is far spent, or the night is far spent, the day is at hand. As Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your head, for your redemption is getting close. Russia is supplying Iran with weapons, with nuclear technology. They are supplying Syria with all kinds of armament, tanks, and any aircraft uh, batteries and so forth. And they are preparing to destroy the nation of Israel. And God tells us that when that happens, that God himself will intervene and destroy them and he'll take the blindness away from Israel and that he will be known by them, his spirit will be upon them, but that means that the church will not be here. By then the church will be raptured and we will be with our Lord in heaven uh, while these events are taking place. God will seal the Jews. He'll take them through the great tribulation, uh, but uh, you know, it's so important wake up the coming of the lord is drawing nigh father as we look at our world and as we read and we see on television uh, the events that are taking place and uh, we get the information lord of these things that are transpiring and even as some are predicting that before the year is out this war of annihilation could begin we pray, Father, that we would not be sleeping any longer, but that we would wake up to the day and the hour and the time in which we are living. And Lord, let us put off the works of darkness and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Shall we stand? We'll have much more to say about this tonight. We've run out of time, so uh, we'll go into the subject further. The pastors are down here at the front to minister to you and to pray for you. And uh, if you've been sleeping, I'd encourage you, wake up. Come on down and say, lay hands on me that I might wake up. <laughs> and be alert that uh, we are getting so close to the end. And uh, may the Lord be with you. And may the Lord awaken each of us to the times in which we live. May we need not be like that sleeping guard who just says coming and uh, then forget or keep on sleeping through uh, the uh, indications that the Lord is giving to us that his return is at the doors. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee and, keep thee. and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give.